I'm Dave Kastler, KE0OG, here with edition 176 of Ham Radio Answers. Let's talk about the optimum height above ground for a traditional half-wave HF dipole. In a previous video, number 100, I said the optimum height for a half-wave dipole is one-half wavelength. I've had a couple folks express reservations, so I thought we'd take a look at it again. Before we dive in, I'm pleased to report that LCSC Electronics is now a sponsor of this channel. LCSC Electronics is an international distributor of electronic parts and is a circuit board manufacturer. Please check out their websites at https slash slash lcsc.com and https colon slash slash easyeda.com. Lots of antenna stuff is explained by modeling the antenna in free space. In other words, in outer space, far from Earth or any other body that could affect the antenna pattern. I have to say I've never seen an antenna in free space. Even antennas on the space station are affected by the body of the spacecraft. So why do we persist in doing this? One reason is because ground is so variable. It can range from rock hard to salt water. The patterns look rather different for each type of ground. Let's take an example. In the Amateur Extra Study Guide, it states unequivocally that the dipole has 2.15 dB gain over an isotropic antenna in free space. An isotropic antenna is a theoretical reference antenna that radiates in all directions equally. By definition, it has unity gain, or a gain of 1, or a gain of 0 dB. This is a great reference for stating gain of other antennas, such as a dipole. The study guide goes on to show that a dipole, in free space, creates a sort of donut-shaped radiation pattern, and that by lowering the gain in some directions, it can increase the gain in other directions. This is how all antennas work, even big expensive ones like Yagi's. They all increase gain in one or more directions by lowering gain in other directions. The total amount of power radiated stays the same. It's sort of like the reflector on a flashlight bulb. The power is concentrated in one direction. So, I used EZNEC Plus to model a simple 20 meter dipole. Now, mind you, the EZNEC software is a modeling tool that is close enough to reality to be predictive, but it's not perfect. It has to make many assumptions, generally good assumptions. Here's the simple dipole. It looks like a wire laying flat on, quote, free space, unquote. Here's the free space pattern, which looks much like a donut. It seems to send energy everywhere except in the directions of its axis. It's sort of like a balloon. Because the pattern is squeezed somewhat, it bulges out at the sides to the tune of 2.15 dB. Hmm. Well, I guess Easy NEC disagrees with the study guide, since it says the gain is 2.07 dB in the maximum direction, which is around the circumference of the donut. That's 0.08 dB difference, which is just completely negligible. Just for added interest, let's look at the SWR of the perfect dipole in free space. It's actually closer to 75 ohms than 50. But if you feed it with a 50 ohm cable, your SWR is still less than 2 to 1, which is fine. Note that you never get to zero reactance here. There's always a little bit of either inductance or capacitance. It's a little known fact that the frequency of resonance and the frequency of the lowest SWR are rarely exactly equal. That's because resonance is defined as the point of zero reactance, whereas the SWR has to do with the magnitude of the impedance. A point with a little reactance might bring the antenna closer to 50 ohms than a point with no reactance. Anyway, that's just an aside. But, as I said, real antennas don't occupy free space. 
They occupy a spot in your yard that's some number of feet or meters above good old terra firma, or if you're lucky, they're over salt water. Salt water is an excellent conductor of electricity and makes a perfect ground, except if you try to step in it, you'll sink. But we can tell the software that we want to model our dipole over what might be termed ordinary or average ground. Also, to add to the realism, I made the wire out of copper, which has slight resistance. Okay, let's get real. I changed the ground type from free space to real of type medium. I set the height of the antenna to a half wavelength for 20 meters, or about 33.7 feet. This is the elevation pattern you get. I assert that for general use, this is about the best you can hope for from a dipole and any higher or lower creates problems with the pattern. Well, I myself have no way to get an antenna that high above the ground. The trees on my property are junipers and pinyon pines, not very tall at all. In the past, I've used two lengths of aluminum fence top rail end to end, giving about 22 feet or so, an idea I got from friend Lou French, K0 LMF. So what effect does this have on a dipole? Well, here's a dipole 20 feet in the air. As you can see, much of the radiation goes straight up. But note over here the gain. The max gain, albeit pointed up at a pretty steep angle, is 6.15 dBi. Wow! Here we thought it was only 2.15 dB over an isotropic antenna. Well, the balloon is squashed all differently than something in free space. There's no radiation going down, so we can double what goes up right there. Now, let's get to the point. What is the right height for a dipole? Let's look at this animation that takes a dipole in one-eighth wavelength increments from a quarter wavelength to a half wavelength in the air. As it goes up to a half wavelength, the pattern lays down toward the horizon in both directions. Now note something interesting. The max lobe gain doesn't change all that much. It does a little to 7.5 dBi. What's happening here is that we're putting our finger down on the middle of the balloon until we get it pushing out toward the horizon. Let's just look at the half wavelength case for a moment. The elevation with the maximum power is at 29 degrees. The beam width, which goes between the minus 3 dB points, is pretty wide, covering 14.1 degrees up to 48.8 degrees, plus of course the same thing on the other side. That's a fairly good elevation slice. For all practical purposes, it covers that 34.7 degree beam width pretty well. Now what happens if we put the antenna up any higher? Let's look at an animation that goes from a quarter wavelength up to a full wavelength. Whoa! We see the elevation profile splits in half as two more lobes form. Let's take a closer look at the one wavelength profile. Well, here we see the extra two lobes. And they're not minor either, given that they're very nearly the same strength as the lower lobes. Now here's the interesting point. The lower lobe has a lower elevation angle than the half wavelength case. And the power in the lower lobe is just as much as before. Well, how can this be? After all, there's no such thing as a free lunch so you can't get extra power for free. Well, what has happened is that the beam width of the lobe is cut in half. This simply means that the wide main beam of the half wavelength high dipole has basically split in half. Yes, the max power in each beam is about the same, but each beam is only half as wide. So instead of spraying your power over a wide area, it's been split into two narrower beams. Well, isn't this a good thing? The power in the lowest beam is now closer to the horizon, which is a good thing, isn't it? Well, maybe yes, maybe no, depending on the location of the far station. The narrower beams introduce angles at which there is no reception. 
I posit that for the general case, you'd like one wide beam with most of the power rather than to cut that beam up into a bunch of narrower beams because as that narrow lower beam goes down, you end up with narrow beams going skyward. Does this mean that you should lower your dipole to just a half wavelength? Well, probably not. Remember that these are models, not absolute guarantees of performance. However, I still stick with a half wavelength high as the best overall compromise. So, now let's look at dipole antennas starting at a quarter wavelength high, which is 16.85 feet high for 20 meters, and going up in one eighth increments in height. This animation shows that as you go up in height, the elevation pattern keeps splitting and splitting into yet narrower beams with areas of no reception in between. This goes on indefinitely. We can look here at these spread out on this chart, going from a quarter wavelength high to one and a quarter wavelength high in eighth wavelength steps. Note that in between these elevation lobes are areas of no reception and no transmission either. Each diagram is on the same scale and we see that each lobe keeps about the same amount of power at its peak, but there's no free lunch. The beams are narrower and narrower. Now, here's an interesting question. What about multiband antennas? Say, for example, a dipole that works on both 40 meters and 20 meters. Well, you can't put that antenna at a half wavelength for both 40 and 20 at the same time. If it's at a half wavelength for 40, about 66 feet, it's at a full wavelength for 20. So what's the bottom line here? I stand by my suggestion that a half wavelength is the optimum height for a dipole that is the best compromise for putting as much power as possible toward the horizon. If you go up higher, you may get some responses from the lower beam width, but you're also throwing power up higher. Now what to do if you have a dipole lower than a half wavelength? Well, this is common, especially on 40 meters and almost universally on 80 meters. You have an antenna that's probably good for more local work, say within a few hundred miles of your location. Note that there is still energy directed down low. So although this isn't an optimum DX antenna, you will still get some from time to time, especially during DX contests. Any antenna is better than no antenna. Put something up and do with it as much as you can. No ham is ever satisfied with his or her antennas. There's always an idea brewing somewhere in the back of your mind about a better antenna setup. Dipoles have the virtue of being inexpensive and workable. You can make your own, as I showed in video 86, on making and using a simple 40 meter dipole. I made one out of stray Romex electrical wire and some electric fence insulators connected directly to some RG8X coax cable. It cost me nothing because I had all of these ingredients laying around the house. Try it out. A full-size dipole up at the right height is an excellent antenna and it can be very inexpensive. I suggest every new general class ham start with a simple 40 meter dipole and as their appetite is wet, add a 20 meter dipole. After you've really explored these bands, you'll be in a better position to choose what your next antenna will be. Thanks for all your support, suggestions, and ideas. Please like and share this video. Please subscribe and also click the bell so you'll get an email notification of all new videos. I like to distribute knowledge widely, and my videos are free for the viewing on YouTube. LCSC.com is now providing sponsorship to this channel, adding to what patrons are providing via Patreon.com and to the tip jar at ke0og.net slash tip hyphen jar. All is most gratefully acknowledged and appreciated. Thanks for your time, and until we next meet, 73.